Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this 6G symposium session as a panel, how far can hardware re technology stretch and scale on the way to 6G? My name is Arno Persinen and I work at, uh, at the University of Oulu and is a, I'm a moderator of this session today. So we are speaking today about hardware challenges towards 6G. The evolution of telecoms technology has tended to more and more performance, more computing, power, more antennas, more complexity. Are we really reaching a point where the hardware evolution and the industry has worked with can no longer sensibly keep up? Very interesting discussion topic that is highly relevant once we are once again looking at the next generation ahead of us. And if so, what are the alternatives? Do we have technologies that can take us forward? And we are having today four highly respected panelists with us. So Pete Van Buck from IMEC will be discussing about the heterogeneous integration technologies saving our 6G dreams. Uh, then uh, Professor Liang Liu from University of Lund will be discussing about the digital basement implementation challenges in 6G distributed networks. After that, Professor Wang Bing Hong from Postec will uh, have a view on antennas, so why 5G antennas cannot be scaled to 6G and ways to resolve. And then uh, Professor Herbert Tirat from Chalmers University uh, will be ending the introduction part on the talk highly integrated DNG band RF transceivers and RFICs in indium phosphide DHPT and silicon germanium biosimus technologies for high data rate communications. And we are having roughly 15 minutes introduction from each of the panelists. And after that, we are opening the Q&A for your questions and try to answer them the best way we can. And uh, not taking too long, so I'll let Pete to start to share his slides and introducing him next. So uh, Pete Van Buck received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Catholic University Leuven Belgium in 1996. Since 1996, he works with IMEC Belgium, where he is currently fellow. He is also part-time professor with the University of Brussels, Belgium. He authored and or co-authored six books and more than 350 scientific papers. His main interests are in analog, RF and millimeter wave IC design for wireless communication and sensing applications. He has been in the program committee of the solid state circuit design conferences such as ESSERC and ISSCC. He is the program chair for the ISSCC 2023. So Pete, please. Thank you, Arno, for uh, this uh, introduction and thank you for uh, inviting me. So what I will uh, speak about today is uh, heterogeneous uh, integration uh, technologies for uh, 6G. Uh, 6G uh, is indeed uh, challenging. We think uh, when we think about 6G, we, we might maybe only think about uh, communication and uh, connectivity, but a but, uh, 6G device typically will also uh, sense and behind uh, the, the, the connectivity and the sensing, there will be a lot of uh, computation. Um, so if we want to realize all that, and, and if we want to hit uh, huge market, uh, several billions of, of, of devices uh, either connected to, to, to people or, or to, to uh, machines, or, um, then um, this projection can only be uh, realized in practice if uh, the hardware satisfies a severe power budget. So in my, in my uh, 50 minutes uh, presentation, power consumption will be uh, central. Uh, now, before we touch, uh, power, sorry, uh, we touch power consumption, just a brief look at the uh, spectrum that will be uh, in use for 6G. Um, 
6G, of course, will also use all the legacy spectra from uh, 5G. So that's that's uh, the, the sub six gigahertz uh, part, uh, definitely. Uh, but uh, also the, 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 the lower uh, millimeter wa uh, wave bands uh, that, that are now being uh, used for 5G. But on top of that, uh, some spectrum at much higher frequencies, and why is that? Well, the lower uh, frequency bands they, they 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 will be they will be congested. Uh, too 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 many uh, de devices use, using using uh, this wireless spectrum uh, at lower frequencies. So we have to reach out to uh, higher uh, frequencies, and uh, uh, this also enables to use uh, more bandwidth and hence to have uh, higher data rates as well. So uh, this new spectrum above on one. 100 gigahertz will be introduced uh, when the 6G will be uh, deployed. First, the D band, uh, probably, and I will mainly uh, talk on, on the D band, but uh, in a later phase, also higher frequencies uh, such as uh, the, the G band. Now, when we go to millimeter wave, uh, and that already started uh, with 5G, we, uh, we will have to uh, use. Uh, Beamforming and what uh, does that mean? Uh, with uh, beamforming, we will duplicate the, the classical uh, transceiver uh, functionality that uh, is in use uh, at the low gigahertz uh, range. So one uh, transceiver connected to one antenna. But now with with uh, beamforming, we will have uh, multiple antennas uh, then then uh, connected to multiple power amplifiers or multiple low noise amplifiers. And also, you you uh, on your electronics, you will have to provide uh, phase shifting. Now uh, we use uh, multiple antennas. Uh, then, uh, what is the optimal pitch? The optimal pitch uh, for for uh, limiting uh, side loops in your antenna uh, pattern? Well, that's uh, half of the wavelength of the. Uh, carrier frequency uh, where you are operating at. And I will come back on, on, on that uh, later on as well. Uh, now, when we talk about the implementation technology, then, then the, the, the first technology we're thinking of to, to make our active circuits, to make our transceivers is uh, CMOS. But uh, over the years, I, uh, say, uh, CMOS has been scaled down and is still scale, scaling down further. But we see that that uh, today with, with the downscaling, uh, I will, will speak today uh, on about three nanometer CMOS, two nanometer CMOS. But we see that the intrinsic speed of the device, uh, the CMOS device, is saturating. It, it, it doesn't increase anymore if, if we, if we uh, express speed uh, in terms of cutoff frequency. Uh, but still, uh, when we make uh, complex transceivers, uh, CMOS will remain the workhorse for the com complex part uh, of, of uh, our sub terahertz uh, transceivers. But CMOS will uh, be a shortcoming when it comes about uh, generating uh, power at uh, millimeter wave frequencies, and especially above 100 gigahertz. So what you see here is um, an overview. It's a scatter plot of, of uh, published uh, papers on, on power amplifiers uh, from, from uh, Georgia Tech uh, University. You can, you can download that, that there uh, for different uh, technologies. And I've put here uh, uh, in, in, in red a line at 140 gigahertz in the middle of the D band. And uh, what we see there, uh, so, so averaged over all the, 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 the publications that we see here is that that um, yeah, CMOS and, and, and by CMOS, yeah, strange, strange enough, uh, averaged over statistics, they generate basically similar uh, output power uh, at, at, at similar efficiencies. Gallimard's night is a bit higher, but uh, the, the champion, both in, in uh, high output power and in efficiency, is uh, in a phosphite. Uh, in uh, at uh, 140 gigahertz. So um, let's then continue with this uh, uh, looking further into that uh, indium phosphide. Uh, so that's a, a compound semiconductor. Um, so that's that's not a classical CMOS that uh, that that or, or classical silicon that we have. So then then uh, we, we, if we want to use indium phosphide, then we have to 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 come to some heterogeneous integration anyway. 
But uh, with any phosphide, you can do some, some nice things. We, uh, here you see the outcome of a test that we did. Uh, we uh, evaluated the, the transmit uh, power consumption, so a B-forming transmitter uh, with uh, multiple uh, transmit antennas. And as a function of, of uh, the number of uh, transmit antennas, you see that, that uh, the power consumption of, of uh, in your phosphide, it, it has, it has uh, with each technology, you have a local minimum. Uh, and you see that that local minimum uh, for uh, in your phosphide is lower than than uh, when you uh, would use uh, silicon technology, silicon germanium by CMOS or uh, plain uh, CMOS. So we have uh, compared to CMOS at uh, 140 gigahertz, we have a reduction of uh, factor two uh, in power consumption, but uh, also um, imagine all those. Uh, consumer devices, they have to be compact. Uh, we see that, that uh, we can uh, realize uh, this, this, this optimum power consumption at, with less antenna elements uh, compared to, to the silicon technology. So the, the footprint uh, being smaller is a plus for uh, consumer electronics. But yeah, in the phosphide, it's 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 a bit of a strange technology uh, for 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 people who are used to to, to silicon. Um, if we want to scale up in the phosphide to 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 the the, the, the volumes uh, that that uh, we uh, foresee for six uh, G, then we need a mature and cost efficient uh, technology, and we also need uh, tight integration with with uh, CMOS because CMOS will still be uh, used, as I said, for uh, the complex uh, part of of a transceiver. So then, uh, indeed, we uh, have to do some heterogeneous uh, integration in one way or another. So uh, in your phosphide itself, how, how, how can you uh, obtain in your phosphide? Uh, well, today it comes with uh, in, in small wafers. Um, uh, here, you, here you see, for example, a uh, heterogeneous bipolar transistor uh, in, in your phosphide. But uh, these wafers are very small, uh, maybe even two inches. Um, so with, with, with uh, those small uh, wafer sizes, uh, probably uh, the economics of, of, of uh, in your phosphide or usage of in your phosphide for 6D will not be uh, right. So we have to go to a uh, large wafer. So, so the first thing that you can do is you can cut some, some uh, in your phosphide uh, parts, put it on a 300 millimeter silicon wafer, and then you can fill uh, the, the empty spaces uh, in, in between so that you have uh, one planar wafer. And then you can use all the, 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 the tools and the equipment in, uh, uh, that, that you have uh, in, as, at your disposal in the CMOS uh, fab. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is, is that we uh, simply uh, start from a native uh, silicon wafer and we grow uh, on top of it uh, with uh, epidextral growth um, some, uh, as you see them here, some uh, indium phosphide uh, substrates. And so uh, then you can indeed go to 12 inch wafers. Um, and so that, that's a technology that, that uh, uh, at IMEC we are developing. We are not the only ones uh, developing that. But this, this wafer, it is not a mock up. Huh? So it's, it's a real uh, silicon wafer with, with uh, on top of it uh, indium phosphide uh, growth. Now, coming back to that, that um, pitch that you have to satisfy with the beamforming pitch between the, the different antenna elements, when you uh, scale up uh, in frequency above 100 gigahertz, uh, you see that, that yeah, uh, the pitch, it scales with, with, with uh, the wavelength. So the area of, of your antenna array, it scales with the square of uh, the wavelength. And so this, this scaling, when, when you move up in frequency, it goes yeah, quadratically, whereas uh, the scaling of, of, of uh, the, the chip that contains uh, power amplifiers and, and, and low noise amplifiers, it doesn't scale down in area that much. So, so uh, we come to, to, to an uh, inflection point uh, below 100 gigahertz even, where uh, the chip becomes larger than, than the uh, than the antenna uh, element. And that's a problem, of course, uh, that, that, that uh, if we don't solve that, then we have a huge 
uh, area overhead uh, with, with, with all the routing, routing will become complex. Uh, and, and as a result, you will have uh, quite some uh, losses uh, in the routing. So yeah, um, that's a problem to solve. And we could do that by uh, using uh, three-dimensional integration. So um, how does that look like? Well, let's first take a look at the classical approach. Uh, if, if we do everything 2D, and, and, and for example, if we use uh, one single implementation technology, silicon or silicon, uh, silicon germanium, CMOS or silicon germanium, and then uh, uh, if we look at the transmit side only, uh, we have uh, multiple power amplifiers, each connected to uh, an antenna. But uh, yeah, uh, your transmitter is more than just a power amplifier. So you 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 have uh, you need uh, supply decoupling. You need uh, uh, also the, the beamforming electronics. Maybe you need some 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 uh, uh, control. You need you probably uh, need, need uh, other circuits as well. So it it all increases uh, the the chip size and uh, at th those uh, high frequencies uh, where uh, the the pitch of your antenna elements is so small. It might be problematic to meet uh, the the pitch, uh, so that, that that would then correspond to the distance between uh, adjacent power uh, adjacent power amplifiers. Well, that pitch uh, it, it might be impossible to meet that pitch uh, on your chip. Uh, well, how can this be solved? Well, let's move to the third dimension. Uh, and then what you can do is you can you can uh, provide a layer. Uh, Maybe indium phosphide because uh, that uh, generates you uh, uh, that, that that gives you uh, the highest uh, power and the highest efficiency. Where you have only your power uh, power amplifiers, and if you have a good uh, 3D uh, heterogeneous integration technology with with uh, very uh, small pitches giving you uh, small parasitics, then you could even integrate in 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 your uh, carrier substrate um, the supply decoupling and on a the lower floor, lo lower level, I would say, you can have uh, all the complex electronics that, that uh, typically you can keep on doing in uh, CMOS. So in that way, uh, using the third dimension uh, allows you to, to uh, satisfy that, that uh, lambda over two pitch. Um, and then it looks like uh, in three dimensions, it, 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 could, it could look like a sandwich uh, like this. Now, a big challenge uh, here is, of course, we have to get rid of the heat uh, that, that is produced by those power amplifiers. Uh, and so that's still a challenge uh, to be solved by uh, the 3D integration technologies. But uh, there, are, there are some, some, some uh, ideas there to, uh, to come out of that uh, problem with some, some intelligent heat spreaders using uh, appropriate materials as well. Okay, uh, I've I've talked uh, about uh, indium phosphide for for uh, the the band uh, operating above uh, 100 gigahertz, but you can uh, say similar things uh, for uh, gallium nitrides. Um, again, a 3.5 technology, not uh, CMOS, uh, which can uh, help you out uh, if you want to generate uh, lots of power uh, at uh, high efficiencies. Um, at lower frequencies, uh, typically in, in, in the, the, the spectrum that is uh, being used uh, or, or coming in use uh, for 5G at 28 gigahertz, uh, 39 gigahertz. And so again, this is a plot taken from that uh, survey from uh, Georgia Tech. You see here the, 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 those, those orange uh, dots, uh, all uh, realizations uh, in gallium nitrate, uh, showing you a high uh, Output powers uh, higher than than, than what, you, what you can obtain in in uh, CMOS, the, the the blue dots and uh, silicon germanium, the the, the, the red uh, triangles. Um, yeah, so so uh, gallium nitride uh, is able to 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 give uh, more power or, or uh, effect, uh, effective uh, um, isotropic radiated radi radi power when you use uh, beam forming more than, than uh, CMOS and, and uh, gallium arsenide, uh, also for uh, user equipment. And so there we have uh, a similar question. Yeah, how, how can we uh, uh, deploy gallium nitrides uh, to a larger scale and going to uh, uh, large wafers? Well, uh, if you use native uh, gallium nitride wafers, they are very expensive uh, and small. 
Uh, gallium nitride on silicon carbides, okay, that's 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 already better, cheaper and larger wafers. But uh, if uh, you would uh, grow gallium nitride on silicon, then again you can go to uh, up to 300 millimeter and you uh, lower uh, the the cost. Now again, again on silicon cannot generate that much power than again on silicon carbide, but maybe for 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 the not too high powers, uh, it it can be a cheap uh, alternative. Uh, and so we have we have uh, yeah, a, a dynamic, and again we are not uh, the only ones in the world uh, to demonstrate that we 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 have shown that uh, this is uh, possible, and that you can even achieve a performance which uh, satisfy handset requirements at uh, twenty eight uh, gigas, for example. So um, with this uh, slide, I I want to uh, finish my uh, presentation uh, showing you uh, the the benefits of, of uh, heterogeneous integration using CMOS and then three five technologies um, and uh, to generate more power and uh, integrating them uh, with three uh, D uh, integration uh, approaches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pete. And while you are changing the slides, I will be introducing our next speaker, who is Liang Liu. He is an associate professor at the Department of Electronic and Information Technology at the Lund University, Sweden. He received his PhD in 2010 from the Fudan University, China. He joined Lund University as a postdoc in 2010 and was assistant professor 2014 to 2015. His main research interests are digital integrated circuit design and uh, prototype systems development, communication and machine learning applications. Liang Liu is one of the main developers of the Lumami Massive MIMO testbed. Liang Liu is a board member of the Swedish chapter of the IEEE, Joint Solid State uh, Circuits and Circuits and Systems Society. He is also a member of the Technical Committee of the VLSI Systems and Applications and CAS for Communication of the IEEE Circuit and Systems Society. So, Liang, please. Thanks, Anno, for the introduction. And as mentioned, I will talk about the digital basement implementations for 6G distributed networks. I will talk about several implementation challenges and the potential solutions. As it is ongoing research activity, I think the purpose of this presentation is more to open discussion, not to draw conclusions. And then this presentation is co-authored with Professor Lisbeth van der Panda from K11. And then together with other partners, we are working in the H2020 Running Deer project to look into a new type of uh, infrastructure we call the radio wave. So, what is radio wave? We envision that the future man manned surfaces, like the wall, ceilings, or furniture, are electromagnetic active to focus energy into space with very high spatial resolution. By doing so, radio wave is able to provide very efficient communication. And then on top of communication, we can uh, radio wave can provide accurate positioning and sensing services, and then can also do wireless power transfer, for example, to energy neutron devices. And then in practice, the, the radio wave concept can be implemented in different format. And here I highlight two. On the left side, you can see that a large number of distributed active radio panels are distributed, uh, deployed in the smart factory scenario. So typically each of these radio panels has around tens of hundreds of antennas. And then these radio panels are synchronized and coordinated to provide different services to different user equipment. For example, you can see the blue part can provide high-speed wireless data links to the user equipment. And then the green part, that the red part of the radio waves infrastructure can provide accurate positioning for the robots in the smart factory for autonomous navigation. And on the right part, part of the infrastructure can provide what is power transfer to, for example, RFID tags. And on the right side, you can see another type of implementation. So we have distributed the radio stripes that distributed in the smart home. 
So from concept point of view, the 6G radio wave concept can be seen as the evolution of the mass MIMO technology, which is one of the key neighbor, uh, one of the key neighbor technologies for 5G, but then they're different. So for mass MIMO, uh, for today's mass MIMO setup, uh, typically the number of base station antennas is around uh, in the range of hundreds, and then most likely those antennas are collocated in one place. And then in the radio wave, we envision that the number of antennas is at least order of magnitude more than mass MIMO, and then they're distributed in the deployment area. And also because uh, of these two uh, features, so it is highly possible that at least part of the radio wave infrastructure is closer to the users. So the key difference between radio wave and the mass MIMO, we hope that you will provide uh, much higher spectral efficiency in terms of communication and transmit power efficiency due to the array gain and also because we can do spatial uh, multiplexing to more users. And we hope we'll, the radio wave can provide higher positioning and sensing accuracy, for example, due to the distribution, the radio wave can see the users from different angles. And then also due to the focused energy, we hope that the radio wave can provide high efficiency in terms of wireless power transfer. And then it is worthwhile to mention that although these concepts can be used in different uh, spectrum, and then this project we're mainly looking at the sub six gigahertz to, uh, to further explore the uh, spectral efficiency there. And then we are also looking at the fully digital arrays, which means that we have one transceiver per antenna in this context. To achieve the processing, uh, to achieve the potential performance gain, coherence signal processing of all the signals from all the antennas are essential. And also because of this, there are several implementation challenges. So hopefully in the next 10 minutes or less than 10 minutes, I will talk about three main challenges to implement such type of new system and one non-challenge. At least it is a challenge we think we can handle it appropriately with today's technology. And then to conclude, I will discuss uh, several opportunities at different design levels, how to reduce the power consumption of such a new type of infrastructure. Let's talk about the first challenge that is related to the data shuffling and then the data storage. One of the methods to perform the coherence uh, single processing is to aggregate the signals from all the antennas into a central processing unit. Here I use uh, zero forcing MIMO detection as an example. As you can see that we gather all the channel state information from all the antennas to a CPU to perform a pseudo inverse of the channel matrix. This type of centralized processing architecture may have two potential issues. First is that the, the aggregated data rate into the central processing unit can be very high. The secondly, that the required memory size to store the channel matrix in the central processing unit can be very large. And then to illustrate these two issues more quantitatively, this table lists out some ballpark calculation numbers and then compare the scaling when we upscale from mass MIMO to radio waves. For example, a typical setup of mass MIMO is 128 antennas at the base station serving 10 users at the same time and the frequency resources. The single bandwidth is around 20 megahertz. And then if we upscale to thousands of antennas and then serving 100 users, and then we upscale the bandwidth to 100 megahertz. So we can see that the required interconnect bandwidth increases from around 60 gigabit per second to 2.5 terabit per second. And it is very challenging for today's interconnection techniques. And then the required memory size increases from around 4 megabit, 3.7, to around 1.5 gigabit. And it is very difficult to integrate such a large me memory on chip. And we know that accessing off chip memories uh, can have very high power consumption and latency. Of course, these challenges can be talked at different levels. For instance, we can have a new interconnection techniques and a new type of memories. But then one solution to solve it is to introduce distributed processing algorithms and architectures. So if we look at the, the centralized processing architecture, so basically where to, uh, the pseudo inverse of the channel matrix is to solve the least square problem centrally. And then alternatively, we can solve this problem in a recursive least square manner. So without going to the details of the, the mass, the uh, main principle is that each of the antennas can process its local information 
And then the least square solution is obtained by passing the information from the first antenna to the last antenna in a daisy chain manner. By distributed processing like this, we can avoid the aggregation of the data rate to the central unit. And then we can also distribute the data storage among different processing unit here. Of course, this opens a room for a new research. So that is the algorithm and topology co-design for, optimi for optimized mapping. And then, for example, this daisy chain and the recursive least square algorithm is just one example. We can have many different distributed algorithms and also different topologies. And then we need to evaluate uh, this code design by looking at the system performance, what is the implementation cost, what is the processing latency, and also the reliability of the system. And the second question that may open here is the so is the uh, processing architecture for 6G. So there are two main trends now. The first trend is to push the processing close to the antennas, that is the distributed processing. And then the next trend is we may have the cloud RAM that we would like to do processing in the cloud. And then these two technologies has its both pawns and cons. For example, near antenna processing can reduce the latency, can relax the requirement on in the connection, while the cloud RAM has more in the cloud, we have more computing power and more flexibility. I believe the jury is still out. So we, have, we don't have answer yet. Uh, let's see how the development goes. So the second challenge I'd like to talk about is the synchronization, because the synchronization is the foundation, uh, foundation to do coherent processing of all the antennas. Let's look at the relative uh, lower complex in mass MIMO system to start with. So this is the Lumami testbed we developed here at the University for Mass MIMO. It consists of 100 antennas, and then the processing is distributed over 15 software radio platforms. I guess some of you may have seen this picture from the front side of the Lumami, but not too many of you have seen the back side. I call it the dark side of Lumami, is all the cables that are used to do the synchronized timing and the frequency synchronization of all the processing unit and transceiver chains as well as the data shuffling between all the processing units. So you probably already have a feeling that for mass MIMO, it is already very challenging. And then in the radio wave age that we have much more number of antennas to be synchronized. And the more, what is more difficult is that these antennas are distributed into a, in a large area, which means that they have large physical distance among them. And then there are several solutions that we are looking to, to perform the synchronization for the radio wave infrastructure. So why is the synchronization over ethernet? For example, the white rabbit protocol that is developed by CERN is able to synchronize thousands of nodes with 10 kilometers distance. And then another method is that we can do synchronization over the air. For example, different radio panels are sending synchronization pilots to each other to perform the synchronization. So the third challenging is the required flexibility. As, uh, as we were discussing, the future or 60 infrastructure is not only for communication, but for positioning sensing and wireless power transfer, which means that the digital processing platform need to be flexible to support different applications and also different algorithms. And we, we know that the different uh, processing devices provide uh, different trade-offs in terms of uh, flexibility and efficiency. For example, we have very flexible CPU, but it's not very efficient. And the ASIC is highly optimized to a certain fixed tasks. And then in between, we have GPUs and FPGAs, and then application-specific instruction set processors. And then which one is the best for the 6G? And then I do agree with Pete that the heterogeneous integration is the way to go. And although it's not integrating different semiconductor process technologies, but here uh, the concept is same. If we, if we integrate different processing units into a hybrid computing processor and then by assign different tasks to different platforms, we may be able to combine both flexibility and efficiency. And actually, uh, this concept has been applied recently to a 6G MIMO processor uh, to uh, process the MIMO processing. And then the result is quite promising. Uh, that uh, this C programmable processor actually is able to provide efficiency that is similar to ASICs. So now I have uh, talked about the three challenges. 
the date movement and the storage, the synchronization and the flexibility. Luckily, it's not all bad news. At least we believe that uh, operating on the large size matrices is manageable. I still remember when uh, my SMIMO was first introduced, the very first question asked was, is it possible to process large size matrices in real time? And uh, actually um, the answer is yes. And then we have several opportunities from different level to explore, to relax the matrix operation. For example, at the system level, as I mentioned, distribute the matrix operation among different radio panels can reduce the matrix size. And then also we don't have to compute uh, the matrix operation all the time, only compute when the channel changes. And then at the algorithm level, the gram matrix, H, H, H Hermitian H here could be diagonally dominant and the inverting a diagonally dominant matrix is much less complex than inverting a regular matrix. And then at the computing architecture level, the recent development in the architecture, in the processing architecture uh, can provide extensive parallelism to speed up the memory processing. And then just to illustrate the case study. So this is a MIMO processing processor in 28 nanometer, and it supports a memory size of 128 to 16. And then what I would like to highlight is that the power consumption is around 127 milliwatt. And then this is very small compared to the other part of the infrastructure. So to summarize my talk, I would like to, uh, to say that uh, um, power consumption is important, and then we have several opportunities at different design levels to reduce the power consumption of the infrastructure. The first one is that the, due to the larger array gain and then, then the short distance between the infrastructure and the users, we may be able to use very low power PAs to reduce the power consumption. And then the distributed processing that I was talking about, we hope we can reduce the data movement between different panels and thus save the power consumption correspondingly. And then from the device level, because uh, MIMO processing and the matrix processing and the matrix storage might be the main source of the power, we hope that uh, in-memory computing with new type of devices like memory stores can provide in-memory matrix operations to save the power of moving data back and forth from the memory to the processing unit. So last but not least that uh, the cooling the power consumption for cooling actually consists around 10 to 15 percent of the total power consumption in traditional base stations. We hope that the distributed architecture with distributed hardware can relax the cooling requirement. So with that, I have to thank you for listening and then thanks for inviting us and then especially thanks to the Renidia team. Thank you, Leon. And uh... Then we move to the next one, and uh, we are having Phong Bing Hong from Postec. And uh, Phong Bing Hong received his PhD BSc in electrical engineering from the Purdue University in 2004, and master's and PhD from the University of Michigan and Arbor in 2005 and 2009, respectively. As of 2016, Dr. Hong is with the Department of Electrical Engineering at Pohang University of Science and Technology as an associate professor. He currently holds the Monia Chaired Professorship. From 2009 to 2016, he was with Samsung Electronics as a principal and senior engineer. So, Won Bing, please. Thank you. So, um, it's wonderful to be here, and I've been very much enjoying the first two talks. So in the next, uh, perhaps maybe the tech 10 minutes, um, I want to talk about a little bit more of the hardware driven aspect of 6G. So uh, the title is why 5G antennas cannot be scaled to 6G and ways to resolve. Um, so I am, first of all, I'm very much in line with um, Piet and Lang's uh, perspective in terms of, of using a, um, a hybrid method. So I don't have enough time to discuss in too much details. Uh, so what I want to do is briefly talk about the, um, the pressing matters, about two pressing matters uh, regarding 6Gs. Um, so we uh, have been work looking into 6G spectrums around the world for different frequencies. We're not quite sure what frequency is the true 6G frequency yet. There's a lot of discussions on 
um, the 140, 120, and 220, and the upper 200 gigahertz, um, especially here in Asia. And uh, for based on experience of 5G or millimeter 5G or FR2, depending on how you name it, uh, we have very much became accustomed to the usage of phased arrays or these high gain directive antennas to in order to uh, beat the path loss. So it's, uh, it's not a surprise that we are um, looking into using a similar strategy um, at higher frequencies to overcome this, uh, this physical challenge. Now, um, so we've been doing also a lot of extensive uh, experimentations at uh, up to about 300 gigahertz um, at post-tech. So we've been looking into what kind of a link budget should we expect and what kind of uh, realist limitations would there be if we were to uh, start um, communicating or um, establishing a wireless network at uh, uh, beyond 100 gigahertz and start introducing um, realistic uh, issues and uh, features such as mobility. So um, things become quite simple if you're talking about point-to-point -point or fixed wireless access. But um, as uh, we're, while we're not quite sure what 6G will be in terms of the service, uh, we do expect it to have some level of mobility uh, because we believe this to be an extension or a, um, an evolution of 5G. So it really comes down to, once again, uh, looking into um, the, neat, uh, the phased array aspects. So um, since Piet did a wonderful job, I don't think I need to go into too much details here, but even though I'm talking about antennas, which is a component which uh, requires zero power, um, the key aspect of uh, consideration of 6G antennas also comes down to consideration of, of the overall power consumption of the R front end and the overall uh, wireless system. Because um, at the end of the day, uh, the usage of phased arrays really is about uh, increasing the EIRP or the, uh, the TX power and also trying to maximize the sensitivity so that we can establish a robust wireless connection uh, between the TX and RX. Now, um, obviously, because the antennas are, uh, are uh, passive components, we need to look into the, uh, how much power one can create at what, what frequencies uh, for what cost. So um, it's very well known that um, if we go back 10 years ago, um, I remember when I was giving uh, a presentation um, about 10 years ago, and uh, we were uh, presenting our work based on a complete CMOS process for 20 gigahertz 5G, um, there's a lot of doubts there. Um, so, um, and I think that was very reasonable because we weren't quite sure what kind of efficiencies what we would be able to expect, especially on the TX side back then especially for a million waves. Now we're going at least 5X from 28 gigahertz for 6G. Um, and I think we all share the same concern that uh, what kind of um, PSAT or phase noise should one expect? So in that regards, uh, the usage of different kinds of um, three or five semiconductors and, uh, and uh, processes beyond CMOS would be a, um, a solution. Now, why this matters with 5G or 6G antennas is, first of all, once you, uh, based on what kind of fabrication method one chooses uh, and what processing, um, that, that determines the overall packaging. Now, theoretically, uh, one can argue that for 6G antennas, if you, have, if you expect more path loss and more losses whatsoever, um, you can simply increase the number of antennas, which is theoretically correct, but realistically, um, it's impossible. Now, even for 5G um, at the moment for 28 or 39 gigahertz, we're, exper we're experiencing the same problem. Um, there is this only so much in number of antennas one can expand and for a 5G base station. Um, we were actually, uh, I, was, I was just got out of a measurement uh, site um, just this afternoon. I was, we were measuring uh, 20 gigahertz base stations to UE's connections this morning. And we realized that, um, that having sufficient number of antennas does not necessarily always guarantee uh, a robust connection to, between TX and RX. And so you, you always need some kind of a buffer because the channel condition is, uh, is variable. And secondly, um, depending on what kind of IC or what kind of fabrication method one uses, um, the routing loss 
the route, the physical routing between the antennas to the, the FEMs, the PEs to the ICs, which are RF lines, uh, will become a very, very large. So at, at a certain point, um, your gain actually starts to drop. So this becomes the physical limit. So um, that basically uh, introduces my first issue, which is, once again, um, current RF-based beamform architectures are unsuitable for massive scale phased array and systems. So if we're talking about 5x, 10x number of antennas for 6G, um, it, in, pra in practicality point of view, you can't do that because uh, based on this uh, limitation and insertion loss. So more number of antennas will actually result in reduced gain af after a certain point. So um, just in terms of uh, to save time, uh, there are there are some uh, solutions out there that are, that are currently being researched around the world. So I just want to share two possible ideas. Um, so the the usage of off um, the perspective of offloading the beamforming functions. So instead of relying fully on phased arrays, uh, we have a secondary hardware which would be a lens or a meta surface, depending on uh, your background. Now these lenses can actually be passive or active. And the whole point here is to further uh, manipulate or modify the beam so that either it can steer uh, at a greater angle or in increase its gain or control its bandwidth uh, or um, beam width. Um, and that would basically alleviate, alleviate the number of uh, the complexity of the, uh, the beam forming process or the phased array architecture in, on the backside. Now, um, this is just an example of a active 6G metasurface, which uh, we use a series of reactors and a pin diode, so they consume very little power. It's, 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 it's a very, very elementary stage here, but the, it just shows that you can uh, refocus uh, essentially um, the, uh, the, the beams uh, with a secondary uh, structure. Now, another thing is uh, approach would be to, uh, so again, you know, mobile 6G is something that's uh, far beyond, but it's, uh, it's something that we need to consider because uh, the UEs will have to be there to, to exist. So um, we, another thing would be to perhaps change perspective. So rethink how phased array antennas or 5G antennas are implemented. So uh, this is how 28 gigahertz antennas are implemented right now on the iPhones and the Android phones, especially in North America. Now, what this says is it ensures that we have a robust connection between the UE and the TX, regardless of, uh, of orientation and mobility. Um, however, for 6G, uh, again, if you increase the number of antennas, you may not have enough space physically. So one uh, idea would be to perhaps uh, rethink uh, where we can actually imp implement these, number, uh, these antennas. So yes, most of our UEs, whether it be tablets or phones, have a large display. And then we have to use the other areas, the leftover area, so to speak, to implement these uh, 6G antennas. Uh, but then that would basically limit our coverage. So then we would start have to looking for a direct access or line of sight, which would be very impractical for most 6G scenarios. So an idea would be to perhaps maybe use the enlarged display panel area. And uh, this is a concept called the antenna on display. This is something we've been looking into. So uh, because 6G antennas are extremely small and they rely on very small skin depth, we can actually use the con conductor layers on the touch screens and use that as the antenna. So this is not a just a uh, makeup concept. We've been looking into this for a very long time. So this is just a quick demonstration. Uh, so this we actually have about a uh, 70 gigahertz antenna, which, which is embedded here, connected to the modem. Just trying to make a point that you we can have phased arrays to be, to establish connection between TX and RX. So that could be one way to do things. Now, um, I know I'm short on time, so that this will be my last issue. Um, just uh, as Piet um, pointed out, um, yes, beyond a, about 80 or 90 gigahertz, uh, the chip actually becomes um, larger uh, than the antennas. So that's basically, it creates a very, very difficult situation in terms of the routing between the antenna. And as I, I discussed, this may introduce unwanted increased insertion losses, which will degrade the performance. And perhaps you can, uh, you, you no longer are able to physically have a uh, antenna and package for 6G. Now, there's a number of ways we can get about this, but uh, one could say, well, why can't you increase the number of uh, the antenna spaces? 
And we know that we can't do that because of the uh, degrading lobes or the aliasing based on the aggressive frequency. Um, however, uh, if you think about the, if you, uh, this is based on the notion that the physical antenna locations determine it, where the electromagnetic waves are launched. It's not necessarily true. Um, first of all, we're, we're, we are relying on a, on a perspective that in 6G, we'll also be using patch antennas as we did for 20 gigahertz. So that's not a requirement. It's just one, one of many options. So there's more than a, tens of dozens of types of antennas out there that we can choose. And second, as I pointed out, the, the so-called phase center of the antenna is which is basically based on the Huygens Fresnel principle. So it, it regards each of these antennas as point sources, theoretically. Um, the location of these, uh, the so-called phase centers of the antennas are not necessarily the physical centers of the, uh, the physical antenna. We can uh, separate those two concepts. So we can actually have phase centers that are differently located compared to the physical layout of the antenna. So by doing that, we can go ahead and be able to um, create a new routing strategy, which is no longer physical limited with this situation. So that would be one way to do it. And the, my, this is my last slide is once again, I agree with uh, the first speaker. Um, we can definitely look into a more of a three-dimensional, a new uh, heterogeneous uh, genius, uh, pa packaging schematic. This is an example of a FLWP or a fan out wafer level package. In doing that, you can create a completely different routing route. So that way you do not have a lateral um, connection, but you can have, it can rely on a three dimensional vertical connections and that could alleviate a lot of these space limiting uh, factors. So um, that is basically uh, my two uh, takes on the current subject. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wang Bing. And uh, we move to our last presentation and from Herbert Sirath. And uh, Herbert Sirath is a professor in high-speed electronics at the Department of Microtechnology and Nanoscience at the Chalmers University since 1996. His main research interests include MMIC designs for wireless communication and sensor applications based on 3 to 5, 3 to N, graphene and silicon devices. He is author and co-author of more than 600 referred journal and conference papers and holds five patents. At the moment, his main focus is to develop highly integrated front-end receive transmit chipsets for high data rate communication and radar applications in the D, G and H bands at from 110 to 325 gigahertz. He is a co-founder of the Gottmik AB, a company developing highly integrated front-end MMIC chipsets for 60 gigahertz and E, W and D band wireless communication and sensing. He's also a fellow of the IEEE. So Herbert, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So I, I will, today I will talk about the integrated uh, circuits for receive and transmit functions um, in the D and G band uh, based on uh, Inifos 5 GSPT and silicon uranium by CMOS. Um, this is the outline of uh, the presentation. I will make an introduction and some motivation for the work. I will uh, talk a little bit about the choice of MMIC technology. Then uh, we take a look at the different uh, RXTX MMICs. Uh, we, we have made uh, the recent years. Then I will uh, make a conclusion and talk a little bit about future work. So uh, going uh, above 100 gigahertz gives opportunities, but also challenges, as we have heard today. Uh, we can foresee new applications and, and commercial products in the area of communication, life science, industrial sensor safety and security, gaming industry, and so on. And a main motivation is while uh, the bandwidth increases, we, we can have higher data capacity according to channel, uh, channel capacity uh, 
or for sensors we can get better resolution. So of course, the, as the wavelength decreases, the size of components decreases as well, and we get smaller form factor. And this comes with uh, a lot of challenges and uh, also potential problems. Um, as uh, a previous speaker has already pointed out, uh, MMIC output power is uh, decreasing uh, rapidly as a function of frequency of the order one uh, over F raised to two or even F raised to three. And linearity and signal to noise ratio is related to the output power. Packaging uh, is becoming increasingly difficult with frequency as well. We might get unwanted resonator modes in the package, uh, even in the substrate of the MMIC, and that can potentially deteriorate the performance. Also, model accuracy is uh, getting increasingly difficult with frequency. Um, so therefore, uh, there is uh, a challenge to, to hit the specifications uh, based on the simulation. Phase noise in, in oscillators might be a problem as well. Typically, that increases as, as uh, 20 dB per frequency decayed for a certain technology. So this means that uh, signal is decreased and noise is increased. Uh, with the frequency. So signal to noise ratio is in general deteriorated as a function of frequency. And uh, last but not least, uh, with high gain devices that might impose stability problems, uh, basically from zero to uh, F max, where F max is the maximum frequency of oscillation. Uh, so uh, at Chalmers University, we have an ongoing project uh, looking at uh, RF circuit design in the frequency range on the gigahertz to 500. Also uh, looking at baseband electronic uh, um, designs uh, for enabling up to 100 gigabit per second data rate. Packaging is part of it also, and uh, we use uh, semiconductor processes from Teledyne, Infineon, and Global Foundries. Some of them have Fmax uh, above one terahertz. The focus is also on real-time wireless communication and high spectral efficiency. And that work is done together with Ericsson Research uh, in uh, Gothenburg. So uh, the frequency bands used today for mobile backhaul uh, is shown here from uh, zero up to 100 gigahertz. Um, and uh, we, uh, the telecom industry is now looking for uh, developing a uh, solution at higher frequencies as well. So uh, we have the W band uh, 92 to 95 up to 100. Uh, 15 uh, gigahertz, probably those frequencies will be uh, deployed uh, next. Uh, and then we have the D band, 110 to uh, 170 gigahertz. And, and there, there is one band here, 141 to 148.5 gigahertz uh, that, that can be used for, for mobile and, and fixed uh, communication. So we have uh, started to look at at this frequency for, for implementing uh, communication systems. Going even higher, we have, uh, uh, as a summary, more, more than 70 gigahertz of spectrum for fixed communication that can be used in the future. So uh, we, we, together with Ericsson, we are building demonstrators uh, for, for uh, radio links. The goal is to now uh, to achieve a uh, hop uh, larger than one kilo kilometer, actually 2.5 kilometer. Uh, already we, we did, uh, based on Indiphosphide DHPT circuits, we did a 200 meter hop uh, at Lindholm and at Ericsson Research. Uh, the capacity we, we could achieve uh, uh, as a function of the bandwidth is shown in this figure, uh, typically for D-band, 
uh, 10 gigabit per second in single polarization with the dual polar polarization, uh, the double. And uh, by using uh, MIMO, we, we could achieve 100 gigabit per second uh, in the future. Uh, then uh, some words about the available MMIC technologies. Uh, this shows uh, um, performance uh, of uh, various technologies such as gallium arsenide, P-hemp, M-hemp, inipocide hemp, gun hemp, SOI, CMOS, CG, HPT, inipocide, uh, DHPT. It gives a kind of uh, flavor what, what can be achieved. Um, the highest cutoff frequency is uh, represented by the indiophosphide DHPT and indiophosphide hemp, uh, M hemp as well, uh, approaching about one terahertz of F max. Uh, silicon germanium today can uh, achieve uh, six, seven hundred gigahertz F max, making it feasible to design circuits at least up to half of that frequency, so 300. Uh, gigahertz. Actually, PHAMP uh, is also improving uh, a bit now, and uh, the recent processes can can achieve uh, performance in D band. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so actually, we started first with uh, making circuits in in phosphide DHPTs, and this is based on. Uh, 250 nanometer technology from Teledyne. So we started to make uh, uh, circuits, LNA, PAs, IQ mixers, up and down, and frequency multipliers to, to make uh, receive and transmitter circuits shown in the block diagrams below. And uh, in 2014, we published the first results and uh, to the right, you see the, the ship uh, consisting of, of the Gilbert cell uh, IQ uh, modulator. Uh, we have the amplifier on the top and the frequency multiplier to the uh, right bottom of that ship. Uh, it consists of approximately 20 transistors, and uh, it, it was already published in uh, TMTT 2016. We achieved about 50 gigabit per second uh, uh, data rate with 64 QM and QPSK at that time. And it, uh, after some uh, packaging attempts, we, we came up with this idea to integrate uh, the um, waveguide probe uh, directly on the ship. Uh, so uh, the ship is now just placed in, in a waveguide structure, uh, split block design. So you, you can see the, the waveguide at the top. And there's a lid as well, of course. Um, but it, this turned out to be a pretty good uh, transition uh, from the ship to the, the waveguide. And we, we could achieve a noise figure of approximately 7 dB in the D band. And this shows a module photo. Uh, and that work was done by Ahmed Hassan, a PhD student in my group at that time. And uh, at the moment now we are uh, uh, designing in uh, silicon germanium by CMOS and starting with the B11 HFC process. So we basically we, we made the, the same kind of uh, circuits um, and uh, uh, this is now the group uh, working. Uh, there's additional some some additional people from from Ericsson also and Simon he, but uh, this, this is now the RFIC team at Chalmers. Um, so the the B11 HFC performance F marks about uh, 370 gigahertz FT250, and uh, we have done uh, quite a number of tape outs in that process, uh, more than 10. Uh, in the B12 uh, HFC, we, we so far we have done two type outs. Uh, this is a, a, a newest 90 nanometer by CMOS technology with uh, about 600 gigahertz F max. Talking with the, the people working with the development of silicon germanium, uh, it is believed that 
the scaling will proceed and uh, we will reach uh, one uh, terahertz F max within uh, a few years time. This is, by the way, the, the uh, back end showing the, the seven uh, metal layers. Um, metal five is used as a ground here and uh, six and seven uh, for, for routing of uh, signals. And there are uh, MIM capacitors and uh, thin film resistors available as well. And uh, yeah, again, the, the, the basically the same structures as for Inucus 5. And the HPT is now used. And this shows a chipset with the receive transmit uh, file. The uh, size is about uh, four millimeter on the length scale. We did a recent link measurement in this case with the polymer fiber uh, setup. We could have used uh, antennas as well, but this is what we use for, for the latest uh, chips that we obtained. Uh, by the way, that, that fiber is manufactured by Huber and Sunur, and it's, it's working in the D band. And uh, we in in uh, 8PSK we achieved a, a data rate of uh, more than 100 gigabit per second, um, with a bit error rate of about two times 10 to minus three. Uh, 40 gigabit with uh, uh, 16 gram, with a bit error rate of 2.4 times 10 to minus eight. So this is the late, latest results we obtained so far. I will now uh, finish up with some details on the D-band radio development with Ericsson. So Mikkel Herbert and Klaus Ericsson are people working at Ericsson. Uh, so they, they use our chipsets uh, and uh, also we designed together PAs uh, that is also integrated in this demonstrator. Uh, the packaging is done by Ericsson and uh, uh, they also uh, make uh, duplex uh, filters. Um, first trial uses 132 gigahertz and 142. And this, this shows uh, at the lab bench uh, how it looks like. So it's a full duplex radio. So with a uh, transmit and receive uh, module, we can also see uh, the PAs, uh, which are clamped to the uh, transmit. Uh, module, um, and th then there is a step attenuator uh, to, to measure the, the performance of uh, this radio. We are aiming at uh, two ranges, one 200 meter and one 2.5 kilometer. And the expected uh, capaci capacity so far is seven gigabit per second real-time communication uh, over 200 meter and 1.5 uh, with the high range. With, with the circuits that we have so far. This shows the, the view from, from the uh, Chalmers site looking uh, uh, across the river towards er Ericsson. So it's a 2.5 kilometer. Some details about the front end. Uh, so we can see uh, quite a, a small uh, PA module uh, consisting of PA ship and uh, transitions to waveguide. Uh, th this is the complete uh, RX and T T TX module and uh, the, this shows a diplexer. So it's all assembled together. Uh, really not as compact as uh, previous speakers have shown, but, but uh, uh, we are aiming at uh, real-time communication uh, within a few, few months time. So. Um, this shows uh, a view of the CAD view of, of how the connections to waveguide look like. So now I will, will wrap up and uh, give some conclusions. Um, I've shown you ongoing work to implement a wireless link up to 100 gigabit per second. Uh, in, the, in the lab bench, we uh, achieved 800, uh, sorry, 100 gigabit per second with 8 PSK modulation. In narrow were bands with 128 QAM, 5 gigabit per second in one gigahertz channel. 
based on the modems from Ericsson with indium phosphide DHPT. Now we are uh, aiming at uh, silicon germanium, uh, more or less uh, entirely. And uh, after the B11, we, we will have the B12 uh, HFC process that allows us to design circuits up to 300 gigahertz. Uh, so that, that's what we are doing at the moment. And we, we are uh, interested in real time communication as well. So uh, it's important then to, to uh, further develop the, uh, the modems. So uh, yeah, some, some acknowledgement. Uh, funding came from EU, M3 Terra and Carter Terra two projects and some uh, in, uh, domestic uh, funding organization, SSF, Wetenskapsrådet, so on. I'd like to acknowledge my people at uh, uh, Chalmers, Ericsson Research and uh, Infineon and Teledar. And this, this will be my uh, last slide. Uh, the, grant agreement from Car to Terra. This is an ongoing project we have now for, for uh, demonstrators uh, of uh, sensors in cabin uh, radars for, car, for cars and uh, polymer fiber communication uh, as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Herbert, and, and thanks for all the speakers of very interesting and, and, and relevant talks today and, and, and time to start the Q&A session and we have some of them uh, online at the moment and feel free to send us more that we can go go around and I think we will be starting a whole round of the discussion for the first question where we are uh, where we'll be asked that, do you think we will be able to develop the hardware technology required for 6G before 2030? When 6G is expected to be rolled out? What happens if we can't achieve the necessary equipment in time? So Pete, please start. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So I think uh, the deployment of uh, 6G it will it will uh, happen in in uh, several phases uh, similar to what we are seeing today uh, in 5G. Uh, so the the, the first uh, usages of uh, 6G uh, maybe will only use uh, uh, even the, the 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 spectrum below 10 gigahertz, huh? and then in a later phase millimeter wave, uh, and then in a later phase uh, uh, sub terahertz, I say uh, above 100 gigahertz. And uh, the exact timing when, uh, or yeah, first of all, I am convinced that that usage of, of, of uh, frequency bands above 100, 100 gigahertz, it will come. But uh, when exactly it will be deployed at, at the large scale, so I think not uh, really at the beginning of, of, of uh, 6G, uh, the timing will be influenced uh, also by uh, extra spectrum that might be allocated below 100 gigahertz. I, we see that today as well uh, with uh, 5G. Eh? Uh, so um, millimeter wave uh, frequency usage uh, is, is, in my opinion, postponed because of uh, opening of the, the, the C band. Uh, so, so, so extra spectrum uh, will, will, will take its time before that, that uh, new spectrum uh, is saturated. But uh, in terms of, uh, of course, uh, uh, we at Dynamic, we are working on, on, on different uh, technologies, uh, semiconductor technologies and packaging technologies. And we have put uh, for ourselves uh, a deadline for, for, for uh, those, uh, for example, for those, those uh, compound semiconductor uh, technologies grown on top or combined uh, in some, uh, somehow with the uh, silicon wafers. Uh, we have set our deadline uh, uh, to 25, 2025. Uh, by then, we we hope that we that we uh, can can show to foundries the way out to to to, to a massive deployment, and then we give it uh, in the hands of, of of the foundries. Uh, and but then with the, the 3D integration technologies, yeah, uh, probably uh, there, there there will be uh, something uh, similar. 
I'm not a 3D integration expert myself, but, but uh, what I see uh, here in, in IMEC, but also in, in uh, Letty and in Fraunhofer, is that those technologies uh, are already uh, very far. And so, so, so it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, of uh, companies uh, to, uh, to, pick, to pick up uh, that and to, to, to deploy commercially. Thank you, Pete. And, and then Liang, if you can elaborate, especially for the digital side, this. Yeah, I fully agree with Pete that, uh, I mean, for 6G, I think uh, all the spectrum will be used, uh, ranging from below 6G gigahertz to mid-wave to sub terahertz. And then the keywords of heterogeneous is coming into place, right? Probably different spectrum will be used for different applications and the use cases, I do believe that. And then another thing I would like to say is that the hardware technology is crucial for developing 6G systems, but then we see that the system become more and more complex. And then I think the joint effort at different design levels are needed from material to IC design to algorithm systems and then digital baseband. I think joint effort are needed. Thank you. How about Von Bing, how you see it from the antenna perspective? Um, well, I, I have to agree that uh, the antenna as well. So I was mostly uh, from, from the antenna display point of view, I think uh, we could uh, scale the number of antennas uh, to a much greater level. Um, but um, of course the packaging issues will remain um, something that uh, we need to figure out in the next uh, few years. So um, in terms of, I think, the hardware, it's the, uh, the, the, the actually having the antennas uh, pre prepared in time. Well, I don't think that itself is going to be an issue. Um, the actual issue will be how would you be able to actually confirm that um, that vital piece of hardware will fit with the rest? Because I think that's one of the issues that we've been having so far, especially for millimeter waves. We know that each of these antennas, PAs, and everything works. Um, but we do, we, we, we do, we have experienced these vital pieces of components that uh, happen to have uh, experienced a, a late delivery. And we've been relying a lot on um, a lot of uh, extended simulations, which uh, became surprisingly were very accurate. So I think a lot of the issues that we um, might face could also be replaced with a lot of um, simulations because um, as you approach higher frequencies, uh, the electromagnetic waves become much more uh, light wave-like, so we can rely on ray tracing, uh, um, and that would be, um, a, I think, would be a supplementary. Yes, thank you very much. And then, Herbert, you are a lot of looking at the fixed wireless side, and, and, and uh, can you give a perspective on the feasibility of that in terms of 2030 timeline? Yeah, what I, I described uh, recently, I think it's feasible to be employed commercially within a few years' time. Um, I mean, even in, in mature technologies such as uh, PM uh, technology, um, output power is one one challenge of course and uh, but uh, even a PHAM uh, technology can uh, uh, generate as much as uh, one watt of, of output power in W band we, we have shown that already uh, at Gottmik so um, from that perspective uh, of, of components uh, I think that they can be uh, very soon available on the market in the in the D band, and so researchers can can use them and play with them. Then, of course, when it comes to higher volumes, silicon would be, of course, more more interesting. But that then the volumes must be very large. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. That's a short answer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So many, many other aspects as well. 
I mean, in terms of waveforms and so on, but uh, uh, that's really, that there are, there are uh, ma many challenges uh, still to, to work with. What I already mentioned, the uh, oscillator noise and uh, stuff like that. Yes. When, you, when you make a, a, a practical uh, radio design. Okay, thank you very much on that. And, and then I, I think there is uh, one specific question to Von Bing. So could you expand the antenna on display solution? So would the user's presence, for example, interfere with the signal path? So what is your view on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I did provide a written answer, but uh, if I were to reiterate, um, so yes, the answer would be a short yes. So the user's presence in theory would absolutely, uh, it could possibly interfere with the signal path. And um, there are two ways to go about this. So we've been working on this problem for quite some time. So uh, it's, I think it's very natural or uh, to project that we'll still be using the uh, antenna diversity and MIMO strategy for 6Gs. So using uh, the, with the help of diversity and antenna diversity and MIMO, we can always have a, um, a direct path to between the TX and the RX, even in a situation with where perhaps maybe the user's hand or the posture could be partially interfering between the LOS. And the second is to, we need to also make sure that um, even though we're probably gonna be having a very sharp beam, we, um, well, this is once again a challenge because you theoretically, if you have a sharp beam, it becomes a me very me mechanical challenge to actually steer the beam, the steer the antenna um, in a, a, a left and right. But so we need, we we'll need to figure out a way to have a sharp beam that can maximize its physical steering angle so that in case there is an interference uh, in the signal path, we should be able to steer away. Okay, Th thanks a lot. And then, then we're having a, one more and, and Pete already answered uh, 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 in written, but I, I think that we can have at the end here a short round from everybody. So we're expecting 6G to use frequencies above 100 gigahertz as we've been discussing today. But if 6G ends up using lower frequencies, let's say around 70 gigahertz, would that scenario change the hardware requirements and, and maybe how from your perspective? So Pete, maybe you start again. Well, it's a, um, my answer is a, is a bit, uh, I've, I've given part of, of that answer already uh, yeah, a few minutes ago uh, as, as, as answer on the, the, the previous question. So it, I, in my conviction, uh, we, we will use uh, the, the D-band one day, but um, again, um, will it be, uh, when, when exactly will we start using that? Um, if it, if it is really delayed by 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 the fact that that uh, the the spectrum below 100 gigahertz can be uh, used for the duration of, of 6g then maybe uh, the, the usage of of, of uh, the the d band and higher will be postponed to 7g but 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 uh, i don't expect that uh, because um the 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 users the the spectrum will be congested probably more rapidly than we think because we um if indeed the the, the number of of uh, devices uh connectivity devices uh worn by humans or, or machine to machine grows exponentially then 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 an exponential is something that grows very quickly no? uh so then then the the, the spectrum uh the the, the, the lower spectrum will be congested uh, very rapidly, uh, surprisingly rapidly, and then, and then we will, we will uh, need to, to, uh, yeah, to uh, use those bands, uh, yeah, maybe by, tw by 2030, and then, yeah, hopefully uh, technology will, will be ready. Now, if technology will not be ready, uh, like, like uh, for example, uh, the, uh, in your, uh, deploy, deploying, uh, deployment of, of phosphide, just to give an example, at a large scale, then uh, the first products will be um, at lower performance, for example, a CMOS solution but, or, or, 
or a silicon uh, a, a by CMOS solution uh, at the expense of, of, of uh, lower power capabilities and things like that. Okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, uh, Liang, any, any issues with that? Yeah, uh, I can talk from the digital baseband per se, some point of view. Uh, from the digital perspective and the carrier frequency is relatively less correlated for the digital, but it's more about the bandwidth, the, the throughput requirement. But then, for example, for below six gigahertz, we try to use fully digital MIMO uh, to do the processing, but then it is very challenging if we move up to a frequency where a large bandwidth is available. So they're probably hybrid or analog beforming is to be used. And also another challenge as I already presented is that uh, processing the data is not a problem, but then get the data into the processor and then the store the data, that's more challenging. So it's always the IOs and then storage. Thank you. How about one bin? So if 6G does happen to start in a lower frequency, first of all, I think um, maybe you said 70 gigahertz. So right, right now, um, there's a there's talks of extended 5G FR2 where the frequencies go up all the way to the mid 50 gigahertz. So uh, mid 50 gigahertz, 70 gigahertz, um, you may it, it's 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 may not be that physically different. So I think the key here is not, as I agree with Lynn, it's uh, um, it's not so much of the frequency, but it's actually about the bandwidth. So if we're talking about like something like 70 gigahertz and 20 percent bandwidth, that would be um, that would still be a challenge. Um, so as you know, uh, there will, we will have similar challenges as uh, we would face if we were to move to D band. So I think um, the hardware challenges, most of the hardware challenges will still remain. Yeah, thanks. Herbert, any quick comment on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if we really want to have the uh, improved capacity, we, we, we need the bandwidth and uh, and we have to go up in frequency, I think uh, that's what, what remains. So I, I, I agree with the other uh, presenters on this topic, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So then we are having only one minute left and, and we end up this with a, that you can name your most important innovation in maximum five words from your perspective for 6G. So let's make a very quick last round. And uh, Pete, most important innovation from your perspective? Uh, I think uh, heterogeneous uh, integration really pushed to, 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 to its uh, very limits. And so, so silicon alone uh, probably will not be able to do that. Uh, we, we, we will need uh, heterogeneous uh, integration, uh, multiple dyes, uh, com complex uh, buildups. Um, yeah, probably with, with uh, uh, three, five technologies under some form, but uh, a, a deployment at, at uh, I deployed them at a very large scale, uh, several billions of uh, in, in quantities. Thank you. So, Liang. Yeah, uh, from system level, I think to further explore massive MIMO and distributed mass MIMO. From the computing architecture point of view, I agree that the hybrid computing and the heterogeneous integration of different devices is key. And then from the device level, I think the in-memory computing with new devices and the high-speed IOs are the key. Thank you. A bit more than a five words, but let's bear with it. So Von Bin. I'll try to keep it short. So economic uh, antenna, sharp beam, 360 coverage. So we... <laughs> Herbert. Yeah, it's. I think the cost is very important. Also, that we we find the technology that that can uh, give a decent cost of, of the systems. And uh, I agree also with Pete that heterogeneous in integration is very important. So we can combine, for instance, gallium nitride, silicon, uh, even yeah, gallium arsenide, and so on. Um, with the antennas. Um, baseband uh, processing is very important as well. 
Thank you very much for all the panelists for your introductions and, and a nice discussion. And uh, this is concluding our session. So for the audience, thank you very much for listening. And I hope we made your nice points for the future thoughts. So thank you very much and bye-bye. <laughs>